Okay, if you have your Bibles, open them to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter uh, 16. In that passage, there were Jesus is talking to his disciples, and uh, he asked them, who do people say that I am, the Son of Man? Uh, Jesus was the incarnated God, and he incarnated himself, called himself the Word of God. He was God here. He was to show us what God was like. What we're going to talk about today, and which is so important, we're going to talk about what is a Christian and what is a church, and look at his mission. Because what we are doing today is we are taking, we are defining Christianity by our social issues. We are defining Christianity by our race. We are defining Christianity by our denomination. And so we don't have a clear definition. We don't have a clear, collective, biblical definition. And so we are Christian. But we are weak. We are, not, we, are, we are not confronting and dealing with the real issues of life because we are so divided. We're defining ourselves. We're having it. When we say Christian, we got to say something else too to go with that. We are black Christians. That's a heresy to have to even say that. We are white Christians. We are Hispanic Christians. We are uh, Korean Christians. That's a bad definition of Christianity. Christ established himself as the God of creation and the God of humanity. He has always wanted to live with us and guide us and to lead us. He created us for the praise of his glory. But we are in not a wall that we Christians created. There's a wall going on in America, and that wall is an American wall. It's a wall between Islam and the American culture. That's what George Bush would have said. He would, he, it's, 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 a, it's a war against Islam, uh, and it's a war, not we Christians. We Christians should be peacemakers. That should not be our war. That should not be our war. We are here to be sound and light and to witness to the totality of society and the totality of the cultures in our society and not totally define ourselves as that. If anyone be in Christ, they are new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And all of this is from God who has reconciled us to himself and has given us the mission and the ministry of, re of uh, a reconciliation. But now we done made reconciliation itself an issue. I'm establishing me a reconciliation ministry. That's what the church is here to do. That's the means by which God brings us back to himself. And so isolating that and identifying ourselves just as that is a misunderstanding of what the Christians are supposed to be. We once, Paul says this, we once knew Jesus as a Jew. In his resurrection, we know him no more. We know him now as the, the God of all creation, the God of the heaven and earth. Now he's calling out, we're going to see that this morning, he's calling out from among the nation. In fact, 
we shouldn't define our Christianity by our nationality. This was to be an international mission. Carry the gospel to all ethnic groups. When he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every ethnic group in the world. And so we got to go, we're going to lose this wall. We, we didn't make this wall. We, we're witnessing. Islam might have an advantage over us. When you become a Muslim, you're sort of a Muslim. When you become a Christian, you got to add something else to it. That ain't good enough. And then, then we got to add our issue. A right wing, a left wing, a conservative, uh, evangelical. We got to add all this other stuff to what it means to be a Christian. So we are not given a good solid definition of Christianity. I'm a Baptist. Mm-hmm. I'm a Catholic. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, 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 and all of these. And, and we are limiting our witness. And we got a new generation of young people is, that is in this room who wants to move beyond that. I'm calling those people post-racists. They're almost post-Christians as we look at it. We need a new, we need a, a biblical identity of what it means to be a Christian. That's important. So we can begin to act with a sense of unity so we can have some power. We should be acting our symbol, our signature, our, uh, should be how much we love each other. Because love is God. He that love is born of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And Jesus says the whole world should know that we are Christian because of the love we have one for another. Our society and our political social environment now is perpetuating hate. In my 80 years, uh, the politicians can't do nothing but raise money for themselves. That's about the best they can do. They can't solve no problem for you. And if you are seeking for them to solve your problem, you are in bad shape <laughs> for you. And so we, the church now, has got to release the power of God back into his creation. And that's what he wants to do. That's what the biblical idea is about. That's what the incarnation is all about. Is God living his life out in us? And we done made Christianity just some good ideals, but it's no longer the resurrected Christ living his life out through us, empowering us by the Holy Spirit to carry out his will. We are getting God to help us do what we want to do. That's why we're confused. You see, God's will is the best for all of society. And that's why he says, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all the things that we need will be added. It is almost like that God is not going to do us good and so we got to get God so that we can make certain that we do good. And another thing is to get to heaven. Get to heaven. And, and, and I meet a lot of people, why are you a Christian? I want to go to heaven. That ain't what Jesus saved us for. He saved us in order that we might reflect his will here on earth. That he would have a group of people here convincing the world that God loves us. That is the message. Uh, John was right when he said, uh, he was talking to Nicodemus. He was trying to explain the unexplainable because what we've also done is that we have moved any mystery from the church. 
it, it's pretty much mechanical. See, every time a person is born into the kingdom of God, that is the greatest of all miracles. And uh, you would make me, healing you would be a big miracle. Well, I could, I really could not have to beg for money if I didn't, if I would just put a towel around my head and go somewhere and tell people to come and be healed. And I would pick out me some signs and wonders that I could do, and the people would be just flocking in. People like that. What makes prosperity Christianity so, so wonderful today? It promises what it's going to do to me. Everybody is living for a blessing. Look, the biblical teaching is that the greatest blessing has already been made available to us. That he has blessed us with all the heavenly blessing when he rose from the dead. He has made available to us. We are not serving God for what we can get. We're serving God because what he's already accomplished. Now what we got to do is access that. And that's what the church is here to do, is to reflect God's love here on earth. John said it's so beautiful in 1 John. He says, as he was, so are we in the world. And so we better get to our Bible teaching here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 because because I, I'm, we need, I'm doing this primarily. Uh, you old folks are not going to change very far. I know that. <laughs> but there's a new generation of people who are looking for a clear a vision of the church. They, they can see that we are weak. We can see that we got our own issues. And we, uh, we, 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 we have such a low self-esteem that we really need God to help build our ego. You, you know, that's, we, we really won't need God to help us do what we need to do. We really need God to help sort of brand us so we can do what it is we want to do in life. Christianity is different. Christianity is to be people who are, see themselves not as strong terminators but they see themselves as servant and obedient and trying to allow Christ to live out his life through us. God's strength is made powerful in our walking in humility and weakness, and then God can get the glory out of that. God resisted the proud. He gives his gr grace to the humble. Yeah. And he says, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty God, that he might lift you up in due time. So we got to come back and come to Christianity. What we got now, what we are building very powerfully, Russia developed, discovered that. Just before Russia fell, they discovered that they had built uh, a system based on personality cults. They had built it on, Len on Marx, Lenin, and the prime minister that, and they said, we want to get rid of these personality cult. The church is almost led by personality cults. The church is a, a collective group of people, a collective group of individuals who have been transformed by the power of God and has joined, become a part of his body. And the church is a collective group of people reflecting God's love here on earth. And what we're doing today, you know, and I look, watch Christians and I look at how they behave in the church. They really is confused because they think that they're going to be able to do individually what Jesus did on earth. And, and so that's why they have to keep speaking in tongues. I love tongues. I love tongues. I love tongues. Don't give me, I'm not hitting on tongues. I'm, I'm asking God every day to get, let me speak on, in tongues. And if I could speak in tongues, I would tell him to help me speak in English. <laughs> that would be a sign to me. I think it would be a sign to my wife. She after me all the time. She, she said, I'm messing up the English language all the time. 
So if I can speak in tongue, man, if y'all ever hear me up here speaking in tongue, it will be not this Ebonic I speak. It would be perfect English in society. Uh, okay, so let's, let's, let's go to our teeth. Do y'all see what I want to do here? I want to see can we put the church. I don't want y'all to find CT Day is just a little group of people who are trying to help the church. The idea of CCDA is to mobilize the church to carry out its mission here on earth. That's what we're here for. Because the church is the bottom line of God's way of revealing himself and the church has been committed to this stewardship of reflecting God's will here on earth through his body, through his body. So let's read our passage this morning, and then we're going to get into our uh, teaching. And then what I'm going to do at some point here, I'm going to summarize it so that you can get a better working, everyday understanding of the church. The church is here to do the will of God. The finding and knowing the will of God is everything. everything. Not just knowing God's will for your life first. First thing, you got to know what God wills that his church to do. And God's will then is to discover our a unique gift and talent and bring that unique and talent together within that body. And the church exists also to strengthen that for the perfection of the saints so that we can do collective as a church the work of the ministry. And so the church brings these gifts and talents together. And when these gifts and talents are brought together in a collective, and these many gifts that he has by his own divine power stored within this collective group of people, then we are being the church. And so we are here carrying out God's will. And that you can't do God's will that much individually. We're asking the wrong question. The question we should always be asking God, God, what is your will? What it is you would have me to do? You're going to hear that in the early church. Paul going to say that this morning in my talk. When he was converted on that immense road, he wanted to know, he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Uh, Paul would have been a wild man. He was a wild man. He would have continued to be wild unless they could bring him under the church authority. And so they said, I'm, God said, I'm not going to tell you here right now. I'm going to tell you. But I'm going to get Ananias there, and he's going to tell you what it is and how to seek it and to find it. He, gonna, he told him what it was on the Damascus Road. He told him, I've called you to participate in carrying this gospel to the end of the world, to the Gentiles. And that was clear. That's, he heard that message on that Damascus Road. But he wouldn't tell him the, how that all was going to come about. He was going to send him to Ananias in Damascus, who was going to disciple him and stabilize him. And then they're going to hear that call again within that collective church at Antioch. And the voice is going to say there, set aside Barnabas and a collective group of people to carry this gospel, to plant these congregations all over the world. And Paul going to say, he's going to go back and say, that's what I heard when he called on that, that massive road. 
And he's going to say, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. But he needs the church in order to confirm that. And then his task was to go out there and, yes, proclaim this wonderful gospel. Now, the, the gospel, if proclaimed, has power within itself. Even Jesus affirmed that when his own disciples were performing miracles and doing things, they wanted to stop him. You remember that? They wanted to call down fire from heaven because they wasn't there. They had a message. They had a message there. And so we got to know that. Otherwise, it's just like the Jehovah's Witnesses are stronger than us because they're a more collective group. And they saw them make us a duty, make us a duty, which ought to be our, we ought to see that as our loving opportunity is to witness to others. We ought to see that as our, our main mission, our main mi mission. Not just telling people, that's important that we tell them, but we sort of show them because love is show and tell is that they need to see our good works, see our good works. And that should be a part of our witness, and that good works is evidence of our love and our concern for people. So the gospel is both words and deeds. Now, most of us have left it just the words. It's both of those held together, and we are too much of this and that. It's this and that. We, we always talk about just one thing. One thing, that's the church. When I was converted in the church 53 years ago, doing social ministry was one thing, helping people, and proclaiming the gospel was something else, telling people about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That has to be demonstrated. That love must be demonstrated. Yeah, Dr. Shula had a good slogan. I like this slogan. When he would preach on his television program, he would say, God loves you, and I do too. I have had people preaching the gospel to me that didn't really love me. Uh, they would have almost preached to me like they would have rather I went to hell. <laughs> they told me more about that than they told me about what I could be doing here on earth being a witness to Christ on earth. And so we are confused. We are confused. So we got to go back to our Bible. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to talk more about that. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to have a Bible here that I want y'all, I want everybody in here to buy one of them. I'm going to sing to my booth tomorrow morning. They'll be ready here tomorrow morning. It, there's going to be a children's Bible. And it's going to be a Bible with all of the, the, the main stories of the Bible. And it's going to be there for mothers to read to the children early. And for the fathers and for the grandfathers to read to their children. You see, what has happened is our own individual concern and our media stuff, and, and it has blocked off these virtues from our people. I was at a, doing a lecture the other day with some superintendents, and they said these kids are bringing these iPods to school and these cell phones to school. We got to circumvent that by bringing the gospel back to the family in the home and to make the gospel in the home and the family the first responsibility in the home. Transferring. We got to circumvent this media. We got to get back because otherwise people are going to get that definition from these talk show gurus. Right. Oprah Winthrop almost went there. I like Oprah. But she almost became her own guru. She was going there. And what she was going, she was almost, and some people define their own brand of Christianity. And we will fall for that cult brand of Christianity. We got to go back to the Bible and see what Jesus intended. Let's go to our scripture here this morning. That verse says, um, 
Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who am I? What are the people saying about me? Saying about me. Now, he's getting ready now. He's getting ready to set up uh, this new entity on earth. He's figuring to set up the church as his main way, first of all, calling people into it, calling people out of the world, and he's thinking to equip them to be his life here on earth. Boy, that to me almost put chills in my body to think that God wants to live his life out through me. That is Christ. I quoted it last night. The clearest verse of Scripture on that to me is Galatians 2.20. For Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, he says. Yet not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I'm now living, Paul says in the flesh, I'm living by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so the Christian life, is, you know, we talk about Christ like it, uh, we, we talk about him, and it's important that we know he died on that cross. That was so important. But what is equally important to that is that he rose again and that he's alive. And he wants to live his life out through us individually, but he wants to live his life out through us collectively. That's why he said, like, for two or three gathered together in my name, God is there in a collective way. That's a little miracle. You know, Paul said it. He says, great is the mystery of godliness. He's talking about us living out this godly life here on earth, that God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, preached to man, delivered up to heaven. And so... God wants to live his life. We would be conscious of that. You know, and people I walk around, uh, they ain't conscious of that. People sort of want, I, I got a lot of that from my own children as they were developing. Vera and I are strong personalities. I can see that now more than ever before. We are strong personalities. And, and our kids, saw us sort of as being God. And if they could keep it from us, it was sort of keeping it from God. <laughs> because they all are almost going to see the wrath. They thought the wrath of God, and that's what we were. So if they told us what was going on, the wrath of God was going to hit them. <laughs> and, and so they, but, but that, that, that wouldn't hold up. As they got older, and as they get older, they see in that just having mama and daddy's religion ain't quite strong enough. Right. As long as they're under our care and we're feeding them and taking care of them, that's pretty good. But they got to find God for themselves, and I'm so glad of that. I'm so glad that my children and, is, uh, is seeking God for themselves. And, I, and I, we're taking some of the responsibility. I'm, we're taking some of the responsibility, you, you, you know, of, of, of that. Okay, let's, let's go to our passage here, and then I'm going to put this together of how we can live it out. See, what I'm concerned about today, I'm going back there. <laughs> what I'm concerned about today is that we learn how to live the Christian life. Don't worry about going to heaven. Jesus is going to do that himself. Well, you ever read that passage? In John 14, when Jesus says, I'm going away, and if I go away, the Spirit is going to come. Uh, Philip said, we don't know the way. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way to heaven. I am the truth about God. I am God. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Then he said, I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again himself and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Don't ask me no more about that, Philip. I got something else for you to do. <laughs> that was a rebuke. I'm the one who's going to carry to heaven. In some of the churches I go to, people are sending up timbers to get to heaven. They're building their own house in heaven. They're, by their good works, they're building their house in heaven. If you know Jesus Christ, if you have given your life to him, and if you are walking in the spirit of God, God himself is going to take care of that. What he wants us to do is to do his will down here on earth, not our own will. No, no. And Christianity is really becoming our helper to do what it is we want to do. And I hear that every day. I hear it every day. Every day. They got something that they want to do, and that's outside of obeying God. That's the burden upon us. That's what prayer is about. Prayer is primarily, and all of the others too, okay, I'm not getting rid of nothing. I'll be careful. You take something away from people, they'll be mad with you. You, you, you. you know, they got to discover what it is they got to pull off. They got to discover that that's they holding on to is hard. And once you get Jesus, he lifted that load of tradition and stuff away from you. And he helps you to, he carries the load with you in society. Just like prosperity Christianity makes you think you ain't going to suffer it become health and wealth. What we need to be doing is expanding our faith so that we can endure more pain Amen. and actually find joy in our obedience. Because Jesus wants every one of us to take up our cross, but also his cross. He wants us to be cross bearers for others. And so what we need to do is to sort of expand our ability to suffer. Expand our ability to, when you get old, you really ought to want to do that. Because you're going to, as you get older, you're going to have more pain. Your life is going to be very miserable if you haven't expanded your capacity to endure suffering. Suffering is a virtue. Suffering creates more room for you to bear more pain. And that you can sort of cheer the world more on your shoulder in life. I have this friend of mine. We spent two, I might have told you that. We, we spent two on um, our vacation last year together. And what we're talking about, he is going through all kind of pain. And he was going through all kind of pain. And what we've been talking about, and I'm going through pain. Vera may have been sick. I'm getting old. And all of this pain. And, and so many things are changing so fast. Uh, what I want to do is, uh, is expand my capacity to cure pain and then to be able to have joy in tribulation, joy in pain, joy in pain in our society. And we're walking around. So we, but what has happened is we don't replace Christianity with ourselves. And it's very hard for you to talk to people today. It, it's very hard for you to say anything that would correct them because people are suffering from such a low self-esteem. And anybody, we should be covering up our esteem with humility. We are sons and daughters of God. Ain't no esteem equal to that. That's what makes the psalmist cry out, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man, we should be the people of great esteem, but let's cover it with humility. Let's walk in humility. We shouldn't be walking in doubt. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it this time. <laughs> I'm going to do it this time. And then I'm going to get on to my teaching. That was my introduction. <laughs> yeah, okay. This 16th chapter here where he speaks about this at here. Uh, where is it at, folks? Y'all help me here. Here it is. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, 
he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Oh, I love John the Baptist. I love John the Baptist. You know, do you, when you read John the Baptist, do you sometimes think about what made Jesus say that he was such an important person? No man born of a woman is greater than John the Baptist. His ministry wasn't that long. Uh, he, he died probably by the time he was 34, 35, 36, somewhere there. He didn't live long. We don't know about his ministry, but just a few months before Jesus appeared on the scene. And so you got a short, and why is all of this power? What was the sort of his power? There's one little hint in the Bible that'll help you a little bit. It don't say this about anybody else in the Bible that he was filled with the spirit from his mother's womb. That is power. Uh, we got filled with the spirit when we accepted Jesus Christ. I was 27 years old when I got filled with the spirit. And some people kept trying to tell me I wasn't filled with the spirit because I didn't speak in tongues. I said, I know when I'm filled with the spirit completely and totally, I've already told you that, I speak English completely. But, 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 but they, they had, to, so they was confused, okay, okay. confused here. And, but, but here, what made John the Baptist so powerful? John the Baptist, and this is important, I'm discovering this. In our consumer society, in our day where we have deified money, and in our day where we can almost have most of the consumer junk we want, but that consumer junk makes us more addicted to it, and it takes more for us in that side. What you really got to do, you got to establish in your life what is enough. That's what retired people like you folks could do. But retired people sort of know how much is enough because they know how much they're going to get every month. And they have to then adjust their life, and they usually become happier people. Happier people. You have got to reduce your greed and your consumerism to the lowest denominator you can live by and then live with joy out of the little excess you have. And it's almost like saving. Saving is one way to get at that. But today, we are spending what we don't have, and some of y'all gonna be glad when you die because you're gonna be out of debt. <laughs> you, you, you know. What made John the Baptist such a powerful figure? John the Baptist reduced his lifestyle to the lowest denominator, and he did not have to depend on other people's wealth. Boy, I really want to do that. It's like, Jeremy and I might have done that now. <laughs> we sort of know what we're going to have, and it's more joy there. It's more joy there. And that released his power. He could say when the rich come, he could tell them what to do. When the soldiers came, when everybody come, and all of it was reducing your lifestyle. If you have two coats, sell one and give it to the other one. You understand? Know and John and his power was released. He could now live dependent on God. Jesus taught us that in the Lord's Prayer. He said, give us this day our daily bread. You understand? And so we are living now. We want God to help us with this debt. We want God. I have everybody, everybody, they, 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 they want God so he can give them more so they can bless us, bless me. And, and, and the blessing was never to be an end. The blessing really was to be for others. The idea you would live with God and his presence with us 
and the blessing that he would give to us would be directed towards others. He said that we first get this word blessing, really we get it with Abraham. And listen to what it says there. I will bless them that bless you, and through you, Abraham, all of the families of the earth would be blessed in our society. You see, so we are living out a sort of a false Christianity. We are using God really for ourselves instead of being here to carry out God's will here on earth. Let me, let me finish this little text, and then I'm going to finish up the whole thing here. Isn't this better than Sunday morning when, the, when you got 18 minutes? I go to these churches, and you got 18 minutes to say something. <laughs> now we got a whole hour. We had a whole hour uh, to say something. He said, I'm on this rock. Look what he says. This is the point I'm going to make here, and then I'm going to do mine. Do what y'all have to have. I'm going to make my points. I'm going to make my take home. I'm going to organize this together here in just a, in just a, in just a minute here. He said, uh, Simon Peter answered, who did they say I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you're right. You're right. And upon that statement, that you are the son of the living God. You are the promised Messiah. You is the one that was going to come that we could trust you. And then by trusting you, you would provide for us the things that we need in life. Now, what they wanted really with Jesus is to get the Romans off their back. You, you understand? That's what they wanted with Jesus. That, that was their main for us at this time for the Messiah. But the big thought of the Messiah, that this Messiah would take care of human needs. And that Messiah still wants to take care of our human needs. But he wants to take care of the human needs today through us, through his people. The church needs to see itself as the continuation of Jesus' life here on earth. And so we are doing what it is he would be doing if he was here on earth. That's why we know our will. He came not to be served, but to serve, and then to give his life as a ransom. That's what we are here Christians for. We are here to become servants of the society. Seeing the aches and the pain and the agony, and I'm convinced that our greatest sickness is our psychological sickness. It's confused in our belief. We need some more central belief. That's what he meant when he said, what is the main duty of man? It's to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, and then to love your neighbor as you love yourself. You would be then, you would find joy and happen. Let me conclude this then. What is a Christian? What is a Christian? I liken that to going down three roads. Preaching is a, is a science. It's also an art. I have sort of went through the scriptures here and give you the scientific and talk to you about the scientific part of preaching. Now what I'm going to do is put that together and show you the art of preaching, art of preaching. And so I'm going to liken being a Christian. The church exists to teach and disciple and equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry is not inside of the church building. The work of the ministry is outside of the church building. And so that's what, it, right, that's what the Scripture is for. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for instruction in righteousness, that the people of God may be thoroughly furnished to do God's good works here on earth. So the church is our equipping station. 
and come where we worship and magnify God and be equipped to go back out into society and to be his effective witnesses in the world. That's the work of the church. So let me liken that. Let's liken the Christian life to going down three roads. Three roads. This is the art. Three roads. The first road in becoming a Christian is the Damascus Road. Y'all remember the original Osama bin Laden was going on that road to kill the believers. You remember that? To kill them. If he found in in Damascus, he was going to bring them back to Jerusalem. He was going to stone them. He was going to kill them. On that road, he met the resurrected Christ. He struck him to the ground. He heard a voice. And this voice could have sound something like this. This is what the voice, if you, it's not what you say so much as it's what you hear. And the sound could have went like this. Saw, saw, why are you so angry and so mean? And why are you persecuting me? He stunned it. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus who loves you. Now, you know that's the central message. That's the central message. That is the gospel, is this central message, this resurrected God saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. He tries to explain that in Philippians. If you read that passage in Philippians, he says, uh, on that Damascus road, I was embraced by God. I was apprehended. And what does it mean to be apprehended? It's to tie your arms together so you can't use your hand. It's to be on, on that Damascus road, it was just like God came down from heaven and put his arms around this radical murder and bind him together and squeezed him in love. He said, Paul gonna say the rest of his life, gonna say, that I may know him the way he knew me. That if I could just love God the way he loved me, if I could love him back, that should be the Christian's idea. You, you should have felt loved by God. Your conversion ought to have been when you discovered that that was a God in heaven that loved you. That's what happened to me 53 years ago. I discovered that there was a God in heaven who loved me. And becoming a Christian then for me is trying to love that God back, trying to squeeze him like he squeezed, squeezed or squared. That's why I need this help, y'all, uh, <laughs> me on that road. He put his arm around me. And then Paul heard it. In that love, he said, I, Lord, what would you have me to do? And that becomes the task of our life. Listen to God in prayer and seeking to do his will. Not my will, but his will be done. That his kingdom would come. So on the Damascus road, we meet God. That's the first road. We discover that we are blind on that road. Our eyes are open when we get some discipleship. Get somebody to help us, to teach us the word of God. And then we discover that God has a will and a plan for our life. He gives us a vision. And Paul lived out his life with that vision. He said, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. So the big question here this morning, are you folks, or have you gone down to the master's road? Are you trying to be Christian without really becoming one, born into the family of God? Uh, your good works ain't good enough to make you a Christian. It's good enough to show that you're a Christian. It's good that we ought to do good works to show that we are Christian, not to be Christian in the world.
That's number one. That's number one. Don't get that confusion out of your head. We've been loved by God. We are loving God back. He told us how to do that. If we care for the prisons, if we care for the broken, we care for the children, if we follow Matthew 25, it tells us what to do there. So that's the first thing. That's what it means to be Christian. Number two, you got to imagine you're going down the Emmaus Road. The Christian life is like going down a highway with three lanes, a freeway. You're on your way to one destination, but you're navigating these three lanes, and you have to be doing all of these once you become Christian at the same time. The first one, you got to know that you've given your life to Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. Second road is the Emmaus Road. What is the Emmaus Road? The Emmaus Road is the road of discipleship. You need somebody in your life. I can tell people when I meet them who haven't been discipled, it is what they want to do. It is what they want to do. The person who's been discipled is being discipled on doing the will of God. The will of God is everything. It's good for everybody. God loves the whole world, all of the humanity, and he wants you and I to be his agent, his replacement here on earth to do that. You can't do it without being a disciple. You know that story. There was two disciples on the first resurrected morning. They are on their way. They are leaving. They are the, the resurrection. They've been confused all the morning. Some women have been to the grave, and they said they saw a haint, a booger man, and these guys are tired of all that confusion, and they on their way home. They're getting rid of this. They're going back to their farm and do their work. And then all at once, Jesus joined them. Y'all know that road? I love that road. And other, any road that I would like to have been on during Jesus' time here on earth, it would have been that, the mass, that, that Emmaus road. They're walking around, they're talking about what done happened, they're talking about what could have been, and, and Jesus joined them. And Jesus wanted to go, what, what kind of conversation y'all having? And they said, we, 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 we are, we're sad. Uh, a person we thought was the Son of God, the Messiah. He lived here among us for three and a half years, and now the other day they killed him. Three days ago they killed him and put him to death. So women this morning, they came down and said he's alive and all that. We've been running and going all day. We tired of this. We going home, back to our farm. And Jesus joined them. And the Bible says he started at the book of Moses, Genesis. He went throughout the whole Bible. Boy, I wish I'd have been with him. He opened to them the word of God. He discipled. They're going to say later, didn't our hearts burn as he went with us along the way? Boy, does a song come to my mind. It ought, you ought to always have a song in your heart. That he walks with me, he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. And the joy we share as he lingers there, none other has ever known. We need the young folks go back and begin discipleship. The church needs to become a discipleship center again to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The last road, the last road is the Jericho road. First road is a road of discipleship, a conversion that you've given your life to Jesus. The second road is a road of learning about Jesus, learn of me. Walking with Jesus, but walking with somebody. You need somebody in your life to help to lead. That's what frightened me that night when, I, when Vera Mae was taken out of our house. What frightened me, I didn't live with her so long. I was afraid to be alone. I was afraid to be alone. And I said, God, I need her. I need her. We walked together too long. 
We are friends, but we are buddies. We are companions. She's been my helper for 20, for 59 years. I don't want to walk alone. It's not good for humans to be alone. We need people in our lives to help guide us, that we trust, that love us, and that we have that sharing. And we need beyond our family. I consider my friends as my friend. Pat, I consider I don't even ask the question. I don't mess around with talking about whether or not Pat is my friend. We've been walking together now for 30, almost 30 years. Half of my friends in here that's that old, we've been walking together a long time. That's what counts. Henry Ford had it right. He said, coming together is the beginning. Working together is progress. Stand together is success. Stand together is success a long time. And what success is going in the same direction a long time. Going in the right direction a long time. Finally, on that Emmaus Road, on that Jericho Road, that's the third road, closing with that. It's the road of service. It's the road of service. There you remember the, the person, the Jew is in the ditch. He'd been beat up. His own Jewish people, his own religious people came along and they was too in a hurry to do religion. They had to get to the temple to do the work in the temple. And they didn't have time. They looked at him, they heard his groan, but what they had to do at the temple was more important than what they're gonna do on the road of a person. They ain't loving their neighbors, they love themselves. They're on their way to Jerusalem to do some service. And so they left him in the ditch. That mixed breed, breed guy, that, 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 that guy down there, that Samaritan is a mix up. He's a biracial child. I like biracial children. You, you know, he's going down that road. He don't have all this bigotry in him. He sees this person in the ditch. He hears his wrong and he walks, he, he picks him up. He uses his own resources. He didn't start no 501C. I'm going to do something when I get my 501C. I meet these people all the time. We're going to do something when we get our 501C. Do something with what you got. First. And so he picked him up, carried him to his own end, took care of him, and he was committed to him being well. He took out his American Express, <laughs> copied this baby, Take care of him. Being a Christian then is going down the Damascus Road, making certain that you know Jesus Christ. He's in your life. The Emmaus Road is a road where we are disciples. We learn about Jesus. We learn about Jesus. We learn of him. Teach them to observe all things what I've commanded you and lo, I'm with you. The church was effective at Pentecost because they were daily in the Word of God, daily being taught the apostles about Jesus and the apostles. And then the Samaria road, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. We're going to develop health centers. We're going to disciple the children. The central to ministry, if you're not discipling children, you, you're not quite on it. Jesus said, suffer the little children all the time to come unto me. And forbid them not, because they're the one who reflect the kingdom of God. Unless in you can be disciplined like a little child, you won't enjoy, in fact, you won't enter the kingdom of God. We'll finish tomorrow. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you so much for all of these people who come here. And Lord, I pray that they would come to be your people. And many of our folks here is developing special ministries 
to reach out in these urban communities and in these rural communities. And Lord, we pray your blessing, and that's why they come. But help them, Lord, to get all of these people, the young folks and everybody, into a good local church. If it's not one there, let's develop one. So the young folk can be a disciple and equipped to do God's work here on earth. And then as we reach out to the poor and the hurting in society, that's why y'all are here. I know that. So bless us this morning. Bless us throughout the rest of the day. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. See you tomorrow.